That'll take a while. <laughs> This is how you come down. Hopefully we don't have too much heckling from the uh, grandstands to the left where Sarah's sitting. <laughs> heckling. <laughs> but anyway, on a serious note, I heard a rumor that uh, New Zealanders, all you Kiwi people here watching the videos, have a lot to celebrate about right now, and you know what I'm talking about. And hopefully Canada gets the same chance to celebrate what you're celebrating right now. So, happy times for you guys. <laughs> Now anyways, let's get right into it. I'm going to get some emails out here from indoors because it's too hot out there and it's too noisy. The ocean's not working out, but we're going to go up into the mountains later today, I believe. So, getting right into it. Mark this one as red. Listen to this. Greetings, Steve. I've listened to your channel for three plus years, just as you got started reading emails. Steve, you, and the round table of knowledge. I know this is a bit long but portrays the matching characteristics, attributes, habits, and pattern aspects across your emails that re represent years. When I started to watch your channel, I immediately felt comfortable and reassured with the experiences locked in my head. Keep up the fine work you're doing. Common sense is in short supply these days, and yours cuts through without any doubt. Very refreshing. Thanks for the kind words. Listeners can pick up character characteristics that match other submissions or what they have experienced. There are many characteristics that can match into different groupings, letting people know they are not alone. After three years now, like you, I am listening for the next new one, but they are getting farther and fewer between, which is good, indicating the list of attributes, characteristics, and behaviors are finite at some point. Behaviors that repeat over and over help point the pitch, help paint the picture that gives people understanding and find peace with their own story. Absolutely agree. You can believe how many people have emailed me and go, they're all the same ones, the exact same thing, on and on. Get your head out of your ass, right? With attributes, characteristics, and behaviors remaining quite similar over the years, the commonalities, commonalities are astounding. Finding patterns that still match over half a century, 55 years later, is intriguing. Tens of thousands of people from all over the world reporting for that long can't all be wrong. And they're not. And we cannot fathom the amount of people who have not shared yet. No doubt. Leap back 55 years in my junior high, the auditorium and the lunchroom shared the same space for that half hour. The first 15 minutes, kids ate their lunch. For the second half of the time, our science teacher would show interesting documentaries and films for those that wanted to stay. One day he played the Patterson-Gimlin film. I was 13 or 14 and spent, a, and spent a lot of time in the woods without scouting or just playing. The film was interesting. I had no reason to doubt it. A little camera adjustment there. Our Boy Scout troop spent a lot of time camping. Shortly thereafter, we camped at a spot halfway between Seattle and Mount Rainier in the vicinity of a small store in the foothills with one gas pump and groceries for hikers and campers complete with a Bigfoot statue, statue unique for 55 years ago. Today, that would make you think of the movie Harry and the Hendersons. Lots of reports from the Greenwater area. Before cell phones, before digital TV, you either read a book or played outside. Though the, those of us interested in the outdoors joined the local scout troop, 
If we didn't have much money, the adults in the troop would drive us to the local military surplus store to buy canvas tents, circa 1950. No, no nylon then. So, sorry, canvas tents, circa, no, circa 1950. No nylon then. Supplies, wool clothing, knives, and packs, etc. I could smell that old tent just when you wrote that down. I remember the smell of those things. That trip, we had about nine people, three canvas, six by six tents, three adults, six kids, ages 10 to 15. We set up in a commonly used area with thick carpeted ground of fur needles, free from underbrush. Two tents were on the opposite sides of the campfire. The third tent was to the side of the one I was in where we kept extra supplies, i.e. let the bears and cats find that before it finds us. During the evening, we all heard far away howls and screams. We all talked about it not being any of the animals we were normally used to. A while later, we heard knocks. Being kids as we were, we decided to find a stick or branch and knock back. Our, our hickory axe handle on a nearby hemlock tree had a beautiful resonance. The knocks were repeated and answered for a short while. People say the screams sound like a woman being murdered, something we knew has always been attributed to big cats, for example, cougar slash mountain lion. We knew the cats of the Pacific Northwest, and this was not it. We discussed the possibility of Bigfoot slash Sasquatch. Partway through the night, I woke briefly in my sleeping bag and heard heavy footfalls outside on the thick carpet needles, which is a hollow sounding medium for non-veteran campers. I was surprised at the feeling I had of complete peace and went back to sleep. Not sure when, but I heard light scratching of canvas from the food tent during the night. In the morning, I recalled thinking that the sounds of the visitor moved past my tent where the food tent was. Many of us got up at the same time, and several people were abuzz with excitement to tell their nighttime tale. Nobody felt any fear. I felt an imposed feeling of peace and calm. One boy, about 10, had just gotten up during the night to go out to pee, but he said he was frozen standing still in the tent and couldn't move for several minutes. His tent mates blamed him for smelly farts, but he swears he did not. Maybe it was just plain Sasquatch stench, which none of us would have known about back then. We all searched around the camping area for clues or footprints. One boy left some candy bars on a log the night before and they were gone in the morning. Our vintage canvas tents were six by six with half inch metal tubing. From the peak down to the lower corners, the food tent had been crushed down about two feet and the tubing bent as if someone outside put their hand on the tent and pushed down to squish it. It didn't seem like anyone, anything, opened the tent though. Attributes observed. Heavy footsteps, howls, wood knocks, telepathic mood control, telepathic muscle control. These are found throughout your emails. I can see how all my observations then now match up to the other email stories submitted to your channel, which undoubtedly was one of your original suppositions. Didn't know what it all meant then. For me, sorry, for my whole life, it was just a set of many characteristics observed in that setting. I always felt the glue that tied those observations together was a Sasquatch. Now, after all, your round table of knowledge emails observing the same things occurring in similar situations, I can take comfort in having guessed right. Steve, I know you get bored of the subject of tree structures, but this doubles the number of pieces of evidence. Beyond the camping trip mentioned above, several years of hiking in scouting followed. Up a tree line is the most beautiful scenery with soft meadows and flowers, and the most spectacular views of hills and mountains that can be found and enjoyed. Western wilderness and forest areas have lots of varying kinds of underbrush and forest floor growth, unlike eastern and warmer states as well as California and Oregon. Learning to be hyper observant while hiking not only gives you more to see and enjoy, but to analyze. There are several types of tree structure and tree activity to be seen. 80 and 90 foot dead trees without any new growth seem to be favored. You can come across an 80, 90 foot tree turned upside down and the small end driven into the ground solid without a digging hole. The previous root ball up at the top 90 feet in the air. The 7 to 10 inch trunk jabbed into the ground without a hole and without any type of undergrowth of grass disturbed. Or grass disturbed, sorry. No scuff marks on the ground or other things out of place. 
No sign of man-made tracks or vehicles in the area. We would search all around and find no hole where the tree was uprooted or dragged from. Those big trees had to have been packed in from somewhere. The roots now on top remind me of a beach umbrellas or Minnie Pearl's hat minus the tag. The tree could be jabbed into the ground amongst two or three close by trees still growing with no evidence of disturbed ground, meaning not room enough for human equipment. If done by a human, large equipment would have had to have been brought in to lift it. The ground would therefore be tore up as further evidence. Many times, three to four inch diameter, 70 to 100 foot in leg poles would be woven through existing trees to create arches or X's of gigantic proportions. We would study carefully wind or blowdowns did not cause such structures. The way poles were woven and which ones were on top of others or interleaved means, excuse me, that nature could not have fallen into such a configuration. They had to be threaded by intelligence like sewing. Most of the tree manipulation was up at the 15 to 20 foot above ground elevation. We would notice deer beds and other animal signs. There would also be teepee and lean-to structures big enough for one or more people made of sticks and poles not made by man. It seems like all the tree structures are far off the beaten path, deep in the forested areas away from man. Steve, blessings to you and your family. Keep up the good work, Wes. All right, Wes, thanks for that, man. And, um, you know, it's all, all those things that everybody sees, including myself, the trees. I mean, I know there's a place I haven't shown you guys yet. Another one I found about uh, 10, I think a, maybe a dozen 8 to 10, 12 inch poles. And they are right up there. They've got to be 60, 70, 80, 90 feet uh, long anyway. And they're all woven up to the branches of first growth mature fir trees where nobody's ever been and uh, leaning against the same tree. <laughs> it was kind of weird. And it was done like long, long, long time ago. And there's no stumps anywhere where those poles came from. It's really weird. But anyway, it's not that I don't like these things we mentioned. It's just that for me, I'm not, I, I don't need evidence myself personally. I don't need it. I've seen the damn things, heard them, know they're there. I want to know. I've got a lot more other questions to, to be answered, right? And I want to smash forward. But in the meantime, I'm not skipping over anybody or any email or any, any words shared. But it's just for me personally. Okay, another stack of trees. Big deal. Moving forward. A footprint. Hmm, whatever. I already knew the left footprints a long time ago. I want to know why we're being lied to. Why? Who the hell are we? What are we? What, what, do we used to be, what did we used to be able to do, right, that they don't want us to do now? Maybe. Anyway, bite my lip before I start ranting. And Sarah might throw a pillow at me or punch me in the face or something. Did you just make a sound? Silence. <laughs> Always too shy for the camera, Sarah. You want to come and read the next one? No. Chicken. <laughs> Alright. Next one. Being touched or marked. Hi Steve, this is Don Priest. You shared my encounter back in July entitled Surrounded by Three Sasquatch. Listening to yesterday's story about I'm back with the elders, a lot of things clicked into place. A lot of my encounters happened in the UP of Michigan, right where you described in the story US 2 slash Hiawatha National Forest. I've also had encounters by Atlanta, which isn't far from Traverse City. I had lots of time over 40 plus years of being touched where I would wonder why me. I do agree with the elders on being of good heart slash equality slash good spirit. I respect the forest people and the woods. I've been a hunter slash fisherman slash outdoorsman for all my life, 52 years old. My question I've always asked myself and still don't have an answer is why me? Why does it mean, what does it mean to be marked slash touched by. What does it mean to be touched? I hear the elders say for life. I've never really went looking for them, but they came to me. If anyone has answers, I'm all ears. I've experienced, encountered a hell of a lot over the years from physical encounters to mind speak and vision slash nightmares. I've had close two foot face-to-face -face encounters. 
I've been roared at from 15 feet. I've had star people encounters, orbs, I got videos. I've had encounters with missing time. If you could ask the elders for some answers for me, I would deeply appreciate it, or some direction. I'm comfortable with them and they don't bother me, more like neighbors or friends that you don't see often. I don't want them to go away. I want them, I want to learn from them, from them if possible. They have thousands of years of knowledge that could help us. Thanks for all you do and please keep it up. I got your back, my brother of the Club and No Return, Don Priest of Michigan. Dan. Sorry, Dan. Uh, Dan, that's a, that's a chunk, man. Listen, I'll tell you what, one thing for sure, I can guarantee a lot of people listening right now, they're going to go, you had one two feet from your face? They're going to want to hear about that specific incident and the description. 100%, as well as me. So if you do have time to send that in, type it out and chuck it back at me, I'll share it with everybody. In the meantime, I'll guarantee you, those who know are going to chime in for you. So maybe they will email me and have me share it to you through this route, or maybe they will comment in the comment section below. But either way, if anybody can throw down a bone of knowledge, chuck it to him, all right? He needs, he needs some uh, questions answered, without a doubt, just like the rest of us, but I, can imagine, I couldn't imagine being in your position with your experiences. That's a holy shit. Holy shit. Okay, here we go, here's another one. Galloping being on NH Route 16 in the White Mountains. Dear Steve, this happened to me last winter and caused me to seek more information and led me to your group a few weeks after the following incident. I was driving home from night, night shift at my job in Pinkham Notch in the White Mountain National Forest. That was a half an hour drive. It was a half an hour drive around 10.30 p.m. I'm always on alert for moose and bear, which can pop onto the road at any time. The night was foggy and wet. Suddenly, about 10 minutes from town, I noticed a movement next to my truck on the driver's side. Excuse me. It was a very large animal running alongside at an angle as though trying to cross Route 16 from left to right. A huge bear? My truck was in the way of it, crossing, and I swerved to avoid it. It was doing about 50 miles per hour, and it kept right up for about a quarter mile. His full coat of six inch long silvery black and gray hair undulating. It thrust its hind legs forward so fast it was a blur, and it pushed its long front legs slash arms under its body to propel. The head was tucked down in the dark. I maintained my speed, and the creature kept right up, not tiring at all. Suddenly, the movement turned into a hyperspeed blur and it launched forward in front of my truck and jumped the guardrail near a stony brook to my right and disappeared, and it was not a bear. I spent a lot of time alone or with others on the mountains of NHNME with many large animal encounters and never saw anything like this before. It opened my eyes that these savvy beings are around. And now as I hike the deep woods with my dog, I notice strange things like uprooted sapling tree trunks and roots stuck onto the ground upside down. Carefully arranged identical stones and patterns on the path and feelings of not being alone. I do as you do, quietly saying and deliberately thinking that I am simply passing through and I have no desire to mingle with or bother others on trail. I travel with my dog and a loaded 9 mil just in case. So far I've been left alone. I bump, I bump into through hikers doing the Appalachian Trail and sometimes give them a ride to town. So far, no one has admitted to any encounters, but I always ask if they have noticed anything strange on the trail. Keep up this important work and sharing the truth is very helpful. You can use my name, Vicky. Vicky, that's a holy shit moment. It's funny how many people email in and talk about the speed, and the speed is what is one of the number one factors that scared the living shit out of them when they saw what they saw. I can't imagine seeing something like that myself. That would be that just make you go, what in the absolute hell did I just see? And did I even see it? Right? But you're not alone. There has been so many people email in with the exact same description, exact same experience. 
crazy. It's a crazy shit going on out there, I'll tell you what. Holy cow, here's a book. Alright, I'm gonna go for it. Going for it. Alright, here we go. Natural law, the key to fitting together the puzzle pieces. Share my name at the end and anything else in this email. Alright. Steve, this is the fifth time I've sent this email. Forgive me if you end up coming across it more than once, twice, but I know it is very important to the fitting together of your and others' puzzles. I'm resending it today in response to your question of why on your October 7th, 2021 video. I've been watching your videos, binge watching them actually, for the last few weeks. I do not have a Sasquatch story, but I have some information that's very relevant to the Sasquatch situation. I'll take a bit, it'll take a bit to lay out, but I'm sure you'll find it enriching. All right, here we go. Today's video from March 1st, Angry and a Caution, 2021, I believe, as I'm resetting this years later in 2023, was very powerful. The powerful part being when you were talking personally about what's going on in the world. I felt compelled to chime in. First off, you're not babbling, not to me. You're talking very clearly, even profoundly. I've been studying the occult for years now. Hear me out. The word occult simply means hidden from sight. Occultism is the study of hidden knowledge. This occult knowledge can be used for evil, the dark occult, or for good, the light occult. I'll quickly share some of what's, what is contained in this occult knowledge, hence I will de-occult it. <laughs> it must be stated right here. You are correct, there are dark people running this planet, dark occultists. A dark occultist uses this hidden knowledge as a power differential against those that do not know it those they wish to control. For if those they wanted to control knew this hidden knowledge, they would be uncontrollable. This knowledge is the foundation of all religions, of all the mystery schools. That said, here's some of the esoteric knowledge. Wisdom is not what we know, but what we do with what we know, our actions. Our actions are what these dark cultists must control. This is where rights are rooted in. Our rights refer directly and in exact proportion to our actions. Our rights are anything that does not cause, cause harm to another sentient being. Thus, wrongs or wrong action, that which is wrong to do, is the opposite of our rights. A wrong is anything that does cause harm to another sentient being. All wrongs are a form of theft, the taking of something that does not belong to you. A wrong is the initiation of force causing harm, or in other words, violence. It needs to be stated that self-defense is never violent. If someone initiates harm unto you, then you have the right to defend against such actions up to and including the taking of the offender's life. These are the true seven deadly sins. Murder, the taking of life that does not belong to you. Stealing, the taking of property that does not belong to you. Willfully lying, the taking of someone's ability to make an informed decision. Assault, the taking of someone's bodily security. Trespass, the taking of someone's security in their living space. Rape, the stealing of someone's sexuality. Coercion, the stealing of someone's free will decision making. What this dark ruling class, sorry, what this dark ruling class has done is they have obfuscated this truth from those they wish to control. They have occulted it to their benefit. The above rights and wrongs are natural laws governing the consequences of the behavior, actions of those beings with the ability to know the difference, beings with free will, or in other words, humans. Rights and thus wrongs can be definitely known. No one needs to believe me. It can be observed to be the case to be true. This is moral objectivism. This is the law of God slash universe slash nature slash creation, whatever you want to call it. The dark ruling class has convinced humanity throughout the millennia that there is no moral objectivity, that rights are granted by an authority, meaning other men. This is a moral relativism, that the truth cannot be definitely known, that men get to make it up as they go. The monarchs, of the times past would decree their right to rule. Over time, people be 
came hip to this and could see through this lie. The monarchs of the old didn't go away. These families just went into the background and created a front from which they can rule from. This front is known as government. Interestingly enough, government comes from the Latin gubernare, gubernare, to control and to mente, the mind, mind control. These rulers just made a new monarchy called oligarchy, which is what government is. The illusion of freedom in a democracy is just that, an illusion. Democra democracy has no bearing in nor in nor sorry, democracy has no bearing in moral objectivism. It is morally relativistic and run on man's laws. Democracy is mob rule. The majority dictating to the minority with no concern for individual rights. This, however, makes the people think they are in control. The required illusion to have the people go along with the system of, of slavery. But ultimately, the ruling class runs governments and the laws. I should note that the USA was formed as a constitutional republic, not a democracy. The Constitution is a special document because it attempted to enshrine these natural rights, although this document is not what gives any person their rights. They have them as a birthright. I had to briefly lay that out to make the point backing up what I've heard you say. I'll paraphrase, but you have mentioned that our purpose here in this life is to learn for ourselves, to make our own decisions, but that we have passed that off to, quote, authorities, end quote. Your intuition aligns with the truths outlined above. Interesting? It is profound when you learn that our actions, individually and collectively, dictate the type of world we live in. This brings us to the natural law that we'll manifest what we put forth. Right action, based in knowledge and understanding, leads to freedom. If our actions as a collective of individuals were right, we would live on a planet of plenty, peace, love, and freedom. Wrong action, based in ignorance and confusion, leads to slavery. If our actions as a collective of individuals were wrong, we would live on a planet with scarcity, fear, death, and slavery. Tell me, which our planet, tell me which our planet reflects now, especially now it is so obvious. We are a morally relativistic society worldwide. This has been the modus operandi for millennia. Operandi for millennia, to keep the people from understanding their rights. Instead, legal systems, man's law, has become the norm convincing people that what is le legal is what is right. Nothing can be further from the truth, and even though some laws do happen to be right. Absolutely agree with that one. Holy shit. Let me reiterate the, the actions of the third part of a trinity of being. Actions are based on a person's understanding, which is in turn based on the information someone takes in. Information, understanding, action, wisdom. As you brought up in today's video, number one, the mainstream media lies to the people. Number two, as someone gets hugely popular, they likely get a talking to. Number three, you yourself do not follow the mainstream media because you are aware of the lying. Number four, you quit listening to Joe Rogan when you detected the obvious censorship going on on his platform. I used to listen to Rogan too and stop for the same reason. What is the common link between all those points? The control of information. Why? To ultimately control a person's understanding and thus a person's actions. You clearly do not like your actions controlled and that is because you have taken in a different information set than the general public, as have I. This is why information is so paramount to control. This is why the dark ruling class control the media. Information needs to be controlled or you lose control of the people because in the end, you lose control of their actions. Fear is an effective tool to get a person to take in the information you want them to take in, which sends them down the path to being a controllable moral relativist. I hope I explained that well enough because it applies to everything from C, vid, to Sasquatch, to 2911, to whatever else you care to lay it over. Herein lies your answer as the, to the question you have postulated where you have wondered what it is that makes people act like sheep. Hiding from people 
what the rights are, and thus the rights of others. Do this through the control of information using fear. I hope it is already becoming clear. This explains what is going on with the C vid. Fear, thus leading to propaganda, information, thus leading to the erroneous understanding, leading to wrong action. How do we know this situation is wrong? The seventh deadly sin, coercion. This whole thing is coercion. There would be no pandemic <laughs> if it wasn't being forced, if it wasn't being enforced violently by the state and all the order followers. Yeah, let me, let me read that one more time. There would be no pandemic if it wasn't, if it wasn't being enforced violently by the state, right? And all the order followers. Going back to step one, there would be no pandemic if everyone stopped watching their TV and taking in that information, fear. Finally ending with Sasquatch. People who have been brought up to believe in authority are in a fearful state. Why do people get ridiculed, harassed, harmed, fired from jobs, etc., for telling others about the experiences they have had with Sasquatch? Because those that because those they tell have lost the ability to think for themselves. Well, bingo. There's a great sentence there. If the quote authority end quote hasn't said it or acknowledged it, then it is nonsense. <laughs> there you go, right? I gotta read that again. I have to. One more time, just to make sure everybody didn't miss it. Finally ending with Sasquatch. People who have been brought up to believe in authority are in a fearful state. Why do people get ridiculed, harassed, harmed, fired from jobs, etc.? For telling others about the experiences they have had with Sasquatch? Because those they tell have lost the ability to think for themselves. Just put that on a friggin' t-shirt. If the authority hasn't said it, or acknowledged it, then it's nonsense. Holy shit, does that ever need to be read out loud on mainstream 50 times a day? People are harassing and harming others, assault for telling their experience, are people who have no understanding of rights. These are people who are in that state of fear as shown is the case of people who are under the, the control by this dark ruling class. As you have said, Steve, people react in these ways out of fear. They do not want to acknowledge this might be the reality. Like anything else then, the Sasquatch situation, how the authorities and the people who believe in these authorities react to it is all about control of the people starting with the control of information. What a freaking awesome paragraph that was. Very interesting how you have mentioned that, quote, people need to get out of the fear and tell their stories as well as get back out into nature, end quote. That is exactly right. Excuse me. In other words, you're saying people need to take back control from, quote, authorities, end quote, which would include, include authority of Sasquatch itself, right? Whether from the side of the storyteller or the person listening to the story. Looking into and questioning about 9-11 leads to people who cannot be controlled. Looking into and questioning about C-19 leads to people who cannot be controlled. Looking into and questioning about the Federal Reserve and private central banking leads to people who cannot be controlled. Looking into and questioning about our true spiritual nature leads to people who cannot be controlled. Looking into and questioning about Sasquatch leads to people who cannot be controlled. I hope you've done a decent job of explaining the underlying principles tying all these seemingly separate things together. Maybe Sasquatch is indeed a metaphysical teacher in the most profound sense. And no, you're not babbling. Give yourself more credit. We are in a spiritual war. Good versus evil. Thanks, Steve. Ian Wayland. Please feel free to use my name. 
All right, here we go. Mark Passio, P-A-S-S-I-O of What on Earth is Happening, and that's actually a domain name, whatonearthishappening.com, is someone everyone needs to get familiar with. This is my daily recommendation of someone people need to hear. There's no other teacher like this man. You will discover through his work why the world is the way that it is and our roles, unknowingly, in this manifestation as I described above. Well, I sincerely hope that everybody stayed as focused as they could on me hopefully not butchering that email to all of you because that is one hell of a frickin' email in. It is to me anyway. And I maybe I should even possibly, I might do this, I may, I'll, I'll mark this so I don't lose it. I think I would like to uh, read this email by itself in its own video one day. I'll put it on Rumble and I'll put it all over the place and pound this frickin' email into everybody's head that we can. That can pick up what he's putting down, of course, right? But whatever leads me to more people that can't be controlled, I'm all over it. Like a fat kid on a smarty. Give it to me. Give it to me. Find my people. Find my people. Then you've got to question yourself. Everybody, question yourself. How much are you controlled today? Hmm? Can you be controlled right now and are you being controlled? Think about it. Wow, that was one hell of an email, I'll tell you what. That was a good one, man. Appreciate you. Email back whenever you want. Email us back and we will uh, we'll get you heard. Thank you so much for that email. All right, this is titled, A White One. Please do not reveal my name. Of course I won't, and you are one of my superhero First Nations ladies. What does she have to share with us today? Hi, Steve and Sarah. Welcome home. I'm pleased that you're all home safe, and we, my daughter and I, want to thank you and all your followers for the prayers. They helped in our time of need. You have a precious little new protector and family member. She'll eventually give you calm and a sense of relief. She'll give you so much pure love. I thought I would tell you accounts of the wild man, and just to be a little different, I thought I'd tell you of a white one. I went to visit my oldest sister in our new, sorry, I went to visit my older sister in her new home. She offered me tea. We sat and talked. She had a humming bird feeder outside her front window, which, pa which faced the beach. I could see across the harbor and the head of the inlet from the same window. I noted that she was very still and quiet while watching the hummingbirds, or so I thought. She called me over to look. I thought she meant for me to notice the unusual colors of the new hummingbirds that, were, that we had not seen before. We talked often of strange birds that we had not seen before. Instead, she pointed to the bluff across the mouth of the river that flowed out at the head of the harbor. My eyes were perfect back then. They are not anymore. They appeared, there appeared to be a person sitting on the bluff. But even from my sister's window, I could see its arms wrapped around its knees. I knew the bluff well because we played on this bluff as children. I witnessed this from the same I witnessed from the same location people setting nets to harvest sockeye salmon countless times. My sister wore glasses and she said it looked like a driftwood sitting on the high tide mark. The tide was down at this time. I told her it was higher than the high tide mark. The hair on its arms appeared to be four to six inches long and it appeared to have no neck and its chin was on its arms. We both turned away to look for binoculars. When we turned back, it had disappeared. My sister said, maybe it was a log and rolled back into the water. It was a calm day and there was no disturbance on the water and no waves. This is an elder teaching. There is no time, distance, or space in the spirit world. Steve, I have a thousand questions about those things and I would like to hear what others have to say about this and what you think of this. This is just one story of the white wild man that lives down in my homeland. I have four or five others, this one white wild man. We need to get together again. And we will. We will. And I remember you telling me about that white one previous, and I remember your daughter telling me that I would more than likely see it once we finally come out there and stay out there with you, which we will. And, uh, and I can see that bluff you mentioned because 
I sat there in my boat looking at everything you just mentioned just a few months ago, right? But anyway, thanks again for that share. I absolutely appreciate you. And uh, I wonder how many other people, I wonder if any non-First Nations people have seen that, that white being around there. I wonder. I wouldn't doubt it, right? Or even on the way there on the road. Or at some of those lakes that where I've been. Anyway, we could talk forever about that. And I'm sure somebody's going to chime in, possibly maybe, right? So Vancouver Island, if anybody's seen a white being, let us know. Picks from a co-worker and his wife. Steve, I know you're not terribly interested in picks, but knowing my co-worker and his wife, I give it 100% credibility. Excuse me, 100% credibility. It's funny, one day a couple of weeks ago, somehow the subject of Sasquatch came up. My co-worker and I was in my, was in my office alone having a short meeting. And for some reason, I mentioned something about Sasquatch, and I thought they were in every single state in the lower 48. Then he smiled real big and asked, I want to see some pics? Of course. I said, hell yes. Well, he had about a hundred of them on his phone. I couldn't believe it. They live out in the middle of nowhere, no more than 35 minutes from my neighborhood house in a city of about 250,000. I'll just say that he lives in East Texas. Go figure. They live on 10 acres, and their nearest neighbors are three quarters of a mile from him through a thick stand of pine and mixed hardwood. No big roads or highways near their house, only blacktop county roads. Also, his neighbors have no small children. They're all grown. Now, I know you have a slight, I know you have had a slight change of heart in showing pics. I applaud you for this. As you said today in one of your videos, it may help someone. As for the tracks, some are very large and some are pretty small. What humans are going to be walking around in December barefooted? He has two ponds on his property. The random sticks are jabbed into the ground about a foot in the pasture. Just random. I'll send you the pics on another email. All at once. You can use them in your videos if you see fit. If not, no big deal. At least you can see them if you ever have time. Oh, by the way, his wife has seen them next to the wood line several times, and one is a freaking giant. She also mentioned they are very docile and seem to be very cool. If you knew this couple, there'd be no way you would think they are staging this. You just have to take my word for it. Just for you, the little side. Okay, man, I got you. And there's one photo there, and I don't have the other ones here, so hopefully I remember when I hit the edit part is to uh, search and find the rest of the photos. And I'll have a look for sure, all right? Anyway, that should be sufficient for today, I believe. There's some great, some great people email us today. Some great, great people. Actually, great people email us every day, right? And every single one of them seems to be a member of the club in no return. And no, you don't have to have had to have physically seen one of these beings to be a club member either, right? I think it's possibly to be a member of the club, club of no return. You just have to be able to think for yourself, be a free thinker, and trust your neighbor. That's about it, right? Anyway, I'm going to get going. Got a lot to do today. It's going to be a hot one. And uh, maybe I'll be able to show you some of the, some of the jungle next time. I'll be back.